Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, please have a seat um, and a warm welcome to our second session today for the conference, The Struggle of Democracy. My name is Nicola Blauma. I'm the program director of the Thomas Mann House. Um, I got here in February, and so please excuse my Thomas Mann-like German. <laughs> I'm uh, working hard on of it, but I think uh, we will have a good time here with um, three wonderful guests on stage. And um, let me just talk very briefly about the question why we chose um, the topic status panic, the fear of social decline in a democratic society as part of our inaugural conference here at the Getty Center. Um, talking about emotions, we could say uh, that uh, in politics, emotions are facts. Um, that seems to be one of the basic principles of political business. Um, feelings drive citizen, citizens to elections, they set the tone in political disputes and prevail in the public sphere up to the columns of the press and in social media. Those seeking to understand the current challenges facing democracy in Germany and the United States, and that's what we would like to do today, um, will have to address the emotions, the social fears and phobias as well that are driving these developments. Although modern political theories often fail to recognize the importance of emotions, it's obvious that democracies need feelings. The workers' movement, for example, in no way lift of better arguments, but from outrage at the living conditions of the urban proletariat. The peace movement also did not gain its influence through rational recognition of the absurdity of violent conflicts but it arose of the fear of an imminent war. But, ro but what role does fear play today as a political factor? If one inquires today in Germany about the most serious concerns of young German adults, fear of terrorism and crime comes first, followed by concern about economic inequalities and a lack of afford affordable housing. The situation in the United States is somewhat different, but related. Studies show that in the US, fear of, corrup fear of corruption dominates, followed by concerns about terrorist attacks, with financial hardship taking third place. As different as the worries and fears expressed in these surveys may be, the concern in the background is almost always about what place I have in society and who may threaten to dispute it. The background conditions that lead to fears of loss of social status are, as well are changing. To discuss these and other topics, we have three wonderful guests on the podium, and let me briefly introduce them to you. Heinz, Heinz Bude next to me is a German sociologist um, with a chair at the university of Kassel for macro sociology, and he worked for a long time at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. Um, in the last year, his book, Gesellschaft der Angst, was translated to, uh, to, to English uh, with the title um, Society of Fear, published at Polity Press. And in this year, um, his last, his recent book was published at Hansa Verlag, Adorno für Ruinenkinder, eine Geschichte von 1968. Claire Jean Kim is professor of political science at UC Irvine. She holds a BA from Harvard University and a PhD from Yale University. And she has been fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and at the Uni University of California's Humanities Research Institute. Her two books, Bitter Fruits, The Politics of Black American, Black Korean Conflicts, um, and her recent one, Dangerous Crossing, Race, Species, and Nature in a Multicultural Age, both published by Cambridge University Press, both received book awards from the American Political Science Association. And we are particularly um, happy to have with us um, Elizabeth Clark Rubio. Uh, she's a PhD student at UC, UC Irvine and also um, activist there. And she, she's very much involved um, about immigrant rights, especially from Korean-American immigrants and undocumented students, and I think that's a wonderful 
and um, enriching possibility for our panel today. Um, just to talk about the procedure for today, we will start with uh, two short presentations by Hans Bude and Jean Kim and then get into a, a panel discussion. Uh, the whole session will be about uh, 60 minutes. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for introduced to be introduced, and thank you very much. I'm very grateful and very happy to be here. But I don't know whether I could. I don't know whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic about the subject we are dealing in this section. I'm following the line President Steinmeier gives. I think. Today's Western democracies are in a nervous condition. Traditional political parties are captured by dubious political entrepreneurs like Sebastian Kurz in Austria. New political parties are founded by self-appointed political leaders during political campaigns. That is the case of Emmanuel Macron in France while political parties that dominated a long post-war period suddenly seem to disappear. That is the case of the Social Democrats in Germany. Scholars from political science, such as Peter Mayer in his groundbreaking study, Ruling the Void, I mention it because of the title, Ruling the Void, the hollowing of Western democracy, dared to claim that the age of party democracy had passed. We are entering a period of post-party democracies with a preference for charismatic dominion. Why is it? Why? The dominant issue of today is protection. Everybody, everyone, with his her, or its special group of reference wants to be protected. The steel workers in face of international competition, the click workers with ex which, who expose themselves on digital platforms, the families with two children with an eye on the education of their offspring, students with heavy loans, digital or Professionals, professionals like doctors, lawyers, or analysts in, actor, in, 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 in interaction or competition with digital expert systems, the members of the LGBT community who didn't feel safe in Saxony or in Texas, elderly want to be protected with small pensions, fishermen suffering from overseas from overseas want to be protected, and farmers being part of speculative food markets, and a big lot of ordinary people who feel unused and superfluous. Many of us are looking for someone to protect us and them. Everybody with regard to his or her or its Special situation is, of course, them right. But how does it happen that the majority in our Western societies share this feeling of defenselessness? I think that's a big question. I think there is an impression of a watershed today. The generations older than 50 now grew up in post-war societies being framed by, by a promise of integration into modern society. The expectation was here that anyone who made an effort, invested in their own education and, and, and exhibited certain capabilities, would find a suitable place for themselves in society. Social placement should not, and in these indeed was not predetermined by one's origin, skin color, religion, or gender. Instead, it could be influenced by will, energy, and a commitment to one's own dreams and desires. I had a dream. The fact 
that chance played a much greater role for most people than goals and intentions was acceptable because it was thought that despite everything, you would be end up in a position that in hindsight, you could feel you had earned and deserved, in hindsight. Who still actually believes this? Most young people who are convinced that we live in a pyramidal class society where crossing borders is pretty unlikely, assume that, them, that they themselves will make through somehow. Even they get by, they don't believe they will have such step-by-step -step careers like their parents born around 1960 or 1965. After all, there are so many things you can do wrong. Your parents can choose the wrong kindergarten, the wrong elementary school, the wrong second, secondary school. You can choose the wrong university, the wrong specialization, the wrong trips abroad, the wrong networks, the wrong partners, the wrong place to live. This implies that your life is a result of a selection process that takes place at each of these transitional points where some get through, but many fall by the wayside. The process starts early and never seems to end. You need a good nose, the necessary cooperative skills, a sober sense of relationships, and a feeling for timing. Some are too early and some are too late. So you are urged to understand that individual's fate is, incre is, is increasingly the expression of her or his or its good or bad life choices. This change can be summed up by saying that the mode of social integration is shifting from the promise of advancement to the threat of exclusion. The positive message to advance is replaced by the negative one of not falling behind. This prompts us to worry whether our will is strong enough, our skills are right, and our appearance is convincing. If at every fork in the road we face the prospect of ending up with those who are left behind waiting for a second chance, the anxiety is really what Kierkegaard says. Freedom's actuality as a possibility of possibility. Freedom's actuality as a possibility of possibility. Anxiety springs from the notion that everything is open up, but nothing is meaningless. Our entire lives seem to be on the line at every single moment. We can take detours, take breaks, or shift our focus, but everything must make sense and, con and should contribute to the fulfillment of our life's purpose. The stress of anxiety is a stress of meaning, and this cannot be alleviated by any state or any society. In the last 30 years, the logic of social placement has been converted from social origin to individual career. Even a solid family background is no longer a safe bank. It's just a resource that truly helps you, of course. But you can also bargain, bargain away what you got. Scholars of social inequality are often impressed with the incredible stability of class structures, but they tend to overlook the micro turbulences within market stability. There are no doubts families try to keep their heritage to the succession of generations, but sometimes the, the, off, the offspring suffers from that burden. In Germany, two, three of those polled between 55 and 75 years old are convinced that the generations of their children and grandchildren experience difficulties to preserve the social status of their birth family. Difficulties. 
They don't have doubts about their children's and grandchildren's ability to do so, but they recognize circumstances that make life difficult for them. Are we not, as they confess in focus groups, running into a time of precarious prospects for jobs, of a deepening social inequality, of a widening international political instability and a worsening ecological crisis? Two features are obvious in the development of the social structure of the German society during the last 30 years. The emergence of a new proletariat and the splitting of the middle strata between a higher and a lower middle class in Germany. Low learners in Germany are rarely employed in industry these days and said most of them are service workers. Around 12 to 15 percent of all employees work as commercial cleaners, delivery men, and carers, carriers or for security companies, restaurants, saloons, and discount stores. They are lousy jobs. These are lousy jobs. They are poorly paid, but demand a lot. If you cover a route for a private delivery company, you are your own logistics specialist, driver, hauler, and custom manager. Your vehicle has to be empty by the end of the day, regardless of how many stairs you had to climb, how high your customer rate, contact rate was, and how heavy the packages were. All of this usually barely keeps the workers above the poverty line. All these income levels, at these income levels, the only way to feed a family or maintain the gap between benefits and wages for minimum income protection is through additional, additional welfare money. The new service proletariat, is, as opposed to the old industrial proletariat, tends to be female and more ethnical heterogeneous with more diffuse qualifications. Cleaning crews, nursing teams, and service staffs are usually made up of women from all corners of the globe with a variety of formal qualifications. A senior, a senior administrative assistants, teachers, and so on. Many of which of these qualifications have not been recognized in their arrival country. These are dead end jobs without the possibility to advance. You are staying in the position you started and you are lacking support by strong unions, and you can't believe that a Karl Marx tells you that the last at least will be the first. There is no Karl Marx for that. In the middle strata, social conditions are getting brittle. These initially have to do with the change of employment risk and status opportunities, like everywhere and any time, of course. Engineers are very much in demand in Germany right now, and they are benefiting from lovely jobs. The situation is different in the insurance sector or in banking, where employment is declining on the whole, with the chair of ex executives in particular shrinking, they are particularly sh shrinking because mathematic experts are growing more important in these areas. It's not just the jobs that became scarce here, it's that status has become precarious. In the case, the image of a fear slowly creeping up the office towers is a fitting one. Senior insurance and banking executives share this feeling of precarious privilege with leading newspaper journalists who believe that they are working in a doomed branch. The web has robbed them of their information privilege. And the free newspapers you, you, do, do, uh, sprouting up everywhere are siphoning away their bias. Freelancers without employees of their own, usually work on a fee basis in the shadow of the welfare state 
as assistant educators, consultants or social workers. They swing from one fixed term contract to another and continually write new project proposals. These usually have academic qualifications and have opted to secure their livelihood through entrepreneurship, either out of necessity or desire. Think of family support worker with a teaching degree or a mediator who has passed a state law exam. Both of them are now scrapping along as solo contractors. It is not their level of education, nor their passion for doing something meaningful that separates them from their successful peers. It's just that they had been that they bet on the wrong horse. There are hordes of trained architects who never had earned money in their profession. More than a few licensed pharmacists have gone bankrupt, and a significant but difficult to quantify number of general practice lawyers in one of our big cities who are just keeping their heads above water with run-of-the-mill cases. That's a new situation in Germany. The number of people that don't earn enough to live and less to die is increasing. This includes not only hairdressers, kiosk owners, and barkeepers, but also lawyers, architects, freelance artists, translators, and university lecturers. With this kind of income, provisions for sickness and old age are almost out of question. This is where the fear of undervaluation is concentrated, which Theodor Geiger, in his famous article from 1930, viewed as the basis of the panic in the middle classes. Anger, anger hate, and resentment arise when people worry that they have not been awarded the social status they deserve based on their education and qualification. And I think that is the case of the feeling of defensiveness in our Western democracies. There is a new proletariat without a Karl Marx, and the splitting within the middle of our societies, and they are looking for someone to protect them. And I have no doubt that a new party who wants to find contact with these groups has to have, has to have something about protection. How could we protect people in a society that is democratic and doesn't say some do and some don't. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Heinz, for your wonderful lecture, uh, your presentation. Um, maybe to start with a kind of paradox um, we see, it might also be applied to the US, but it's, it's particularly obvious in Germany, I think. Uh, we experience a quite um, flourishing, um, prosperous um, economic uh, development in recent years in Germany, especially in the last 10 years. The unemployment rate is um, on a historically uh, low level, so the people have quite options um, regarding their careers, also, also the social uh, system is quite stable, but on the other hand, um, it seems to us that fear seems to be yeah, a driving force in the political system. So, for me, it seems to be yeah, a kind of par a paradox situation on the one hand side. Um, if you uh, look on it uh, on the perspective of research, objectively quite positive data, but subjectively um, this panic and status panic, social fear, and 
Yeah, what do you think, um, how could, could you explain that, feelings? <laughs> that is a very interesting thing. More than 80% in Germany think that their personal situation is quite good. And they're looking with optimism into their own future. But these the satisfied, if you ask these satisfies how they look at the whole of society, two-thirds of them think that something completely going wrong in Germany. And that is the interesting thing. They are, in a way, satisfied with their own situation, but they think there is no, I put it in another way, there is no future to believe in. And that is the interesting thing. I think there are two, two three subjects people are very worried about. The first, of course, the subject of migration. The second thing is the subject of growing social inequality, field for the people. And the third thing is capitalism. A lot of people think that capitalism reveals its own vulnerability. That was the 2008 experience. And this 2008 experience is still of relevance for the people. And that is, there is no good interpretation for them for this situation. So it's get into the sphere of feeling. They feel insecure in capitalism. They feel insecure in, in, the, in the society of, 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 of capabilities and the society of chances. And they think they are coming settlers into the country that give away, that take away their cultural security. Maybe we can also focus on the second um, aspect you mentioned, migration, and might also al already lead over to uh, Claire Dean Kim's uh, presentation. But one question regarding Germany. I mean, migration, obviously, and I think all of us here also in the audience knows that uh, the number of migrations or immigrants uh, from Northern Africa and um, from the borders, the fringes of Europe uh, is a quite high one, especially uh, since 2015. But you um, very much focused in your, in your lecture on the economic um, factors or the economic driving forces for, um, for the status panic. What do you think, Hans Bude, um, what uh, role does migration play for the current um, relevance of social fear for the democratic society in Germany? For the service proletariat, migration is very important because they think they, they, are, they are people coming into the country that, um, that are taking their places. You know, the, the, the bus with the... In, in the bus with the service proletariat, there is struggle in the bus. And this struggle in the bus has to do with migration. And they believe that the normal public is ignoring their problems. We have the problems of these 20, 12 to 15 percent that they feel that their problems of everyday life is ignored by the normal political agenda. And th that is a very interesting thing. And the second thing, those feeling that they are on the on the way to the under, the, the, the lower part of the middle classes feel, okay, we are ignored as well. So we have a feeling of ignorance in our society, and that is one of the reasons why the social democrats, um, who are viewed as a party that, gave, that brought this new idea of a liberal life, that they, they are, are not, um, people are, couldn't believe in them. And so that is, in, the, the idea is of, the feeling is of, the, of an ignorance. And that is, I think, a very, very, one of the reasons why Western democracy are in that nervous condition. I'm pretty sure that ignorance and predetermination um, of the social status is also relevant for Claire Jean Kim's um, presentation. And yeah, <laughs> um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my thanks to Nikolai for inviting me to participate. I'm very glad to be here with Liz. 
Clark Rubio, whom I have the pleasure of working with at UCI. So on November 8th, 2016, when the results of the US presidential election became clear, many Americans wanted to know, how did Donald Trump pull out such an improbable win? After the smoke cleared, exit polls and surveys yielded the answer. Race had driven the election results, and whites, wealthy, petty bourgeois, working class, young and old, rural and suburban, women and men, had voted for Trump because of their fear and anxiety about losing their majority status in the coming decades. This, in any case, has been the conventional wisdom, that white people are back on their heels, fearful of change, responding to demographic uh, inevitability. Today, I want to challenge the idea that it was racial fear that was animating white Americans in the voting booth, and suggest rather that the animating affective force was something else, something more akin to racial hatred and contempt. I further want to argue that this hatred, far from being situational or reactive, is part of an enduring worldview, a fully formed, coherent Weltanschauung, the crux of which is white dominance, and that this worldview has held sway for most of the nation's history and prehistory and is now, with Donald Trump, ascendant once more. Fear is more politically acceptable than hatred, and it serves as a fig leaf with which hatred can conceal itself. It is hatred, then, we must seek to understand, so where do we begin? This is a statue from the new National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Atlanta, Georgia, created by Brian Stevenson and others at the Equal Justice Initiative. Since the time of slavery, that is, since before the US nation was a nation, the social order has been anti-black, by which I mean following scholars in critical black studies that the social order has been founded upon black abjection. It is an order where the coherence of the white, the human, and the nation have depended upon, has depended upon not just the labor of the slave, but the idea of the slave as black, animal, not human. Because of the nation's revolutionary ideals and creedal values, of course, slavery has always been rather on the defensive in the US. And slaveholders have known that they needed to justify the unspeakable violence of slavery, a violence that, in Hortense Spiller's words, rendered black bodies into mere flesh. Denying their own hatred, slaveholders emphasized their fear of any decline in white control, above all, their fear of slave revolt. Their fevered imaginings of slave vengeance and slave control, influenced by the success of the Haitian Revolution, inverted power relations and projected their own criminality onto slaves refiguring them as a threat to the white woman, the white family, the white nation, the white self. This is why when Nat Turner was caught, this is a white artist's depiction of his 1831 rebellion, it was not enough to execute him. It was necessary to boil his body down into an oil and consume him. One of our clearest inheritances from slavery is the trope of black criminality, which dissimulates hatred as fear. After the US Civil War, the South made one thing clear. They had lost the war, but they meant to keep slavery. Within 12 years, they had shut down the half-hearted experiment in racial democracy known as federal reconstruction, and set about restoring Southern society as closely as possible to its antebellum glory. What this required, above all, was putting the Negro back in his place. Again, hatred disguised itself as fear, and the project of recuperation was presented, as in this image depicting the horrors of Negro rule, as a defensive maneuver to protect society from the rapacious Negro brutes unleashed by the Northern Army. Thus emerged the system of de jure segregation, economic dispossession, and political disenfranchisement known as Jim Crow as well as its lesser known counterpart, the convict lease system, where laws were passed that created new crimes such as vagrancy, which were enforced only against black people, whereupon sheriffs would arrest them, convict them, and then lease them out as labor to plantation owners and industrial elites. Over the course of a half century, many thousands of black men lost their freedom and their lives in this elaborate scheme designed by sheriffs and white political and economic leaders. Reflecting on the postbellum period, historian Saidiya Hartman points out, emancipation was not the historical break that it purported to be, and that we would do better to think about how racial power reconfigures itself and persists over time. In Hartman's 
powerful phrase, we live in the afterlife of slavery. Lynching was a key instrument of racial control during Jim Crow. Anti-lynching activist Ida B. Wells compiled a list of offenses that lynching victims were charged with, startling in their ordinariness, such as arguing with a white person, or not giving way on the sidewalk to a white person, or incendiarism, which meant saying incendiary things. Though Wells demonstrated that only a quarter or so of lynchings involved the accusation of rape, and often to cover up consensual relations between white women and black men, the production of the figure of the black male rapist was indispensable to Jim Crow, as it cast white hatred as an honorable protective instinct, and thus justified the atrocious violence of lynching, as in this newspaper article. No one can leave his family at night without the dread that some roving Negro ruffian is watching and waiting for this opportunity. The swift punishment which invariably follows these horrible crimes doubtless acts as a deterring effect upon the Negroes in that immediate neighborhood for a short time, but the lesson is not widely learned nor long remembered. There is small reason to hope for any change for the better. The commission of this crime grows more frequent every year. The generation of Negroes which have grown up since the war have lost in large measure the traditional and wholesome awe of the white race which kept Negroes in subjection, even when their masters were in the army and their families left unprotected except by the slaves themselves. There is no longer a restraint upon the brute passion of the Negro. White Southern senators who filibustered anti-lynching bills in the US Congress for decades cited fear of the black male rapist in every speech they made. But if we consider spectacle lynchings, lynchings where the intent to lynch was advertised in newspapers days in advance, where as many as 10,000 whites came from surrounding areas to watch and participate, where parents wrote notes excusing their kids from school so that they could attend the lynching as a family, where sheriffs handed over the prisoner who was tormented, dragged, mutilated, hung, shot hundreds of times and then burned, where popcorn and other foods were sold so that people could snack while lynching, where children scrambled in the ashes afterwards, fighting one another for mementos such as knuckles, genitals, and toes, where professional photographers captured it all on film and then set up stands where they sold the photos as postcards that were then circulated among one white families and communities, wish you had been there. If we consider spectacle lynchings, it is not fear that comes to mind, but hatred and indeed a certain kind of frenzied joy, an ecstasy at the assertion of pure dominance over the other. As D.W. Griffith indicated in his 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, it was through the ritual of lynching that North-South reconciliation was achieved and the US nation was healed. It was over the body of the black victim that Northern whites and Southern whites once again recognized each other as brothers. As early as the 1980s, critical race theorists like Derek Bell warned that the civil rights reforms of the 1960s and 1970s were not as substantial as we had thought. And they were right in two senses. First, anti-blackness has found expression in new forms of structural oppression that carry forward the ethos of slavery under the guise of colorblindness. Here I refer to the continuing hypersegregation of blacks and blacks alone, hyper-policing, the war on drugs, the war on crime, the school to prison pipeline, and the development in the last several decades of a system of mass incarceration that is unrivaled among Western nations. One in three black men living in the US can expect to be swept up into the prison system in his lifetime with all that this, this entails for him and those close to him and their ability to survive. Second, the central gains of the civil rights movement, the US civil rights movement, the desegregation of public spaces and the protection of voting rights. Both of these issues have never been fully conceded by many whites. On the first point, the desegregation of public spaces, one way to think about the police killings of black people in the United States is that they put black people back in their place, symbolically and physically. They resist the desegregation of public space. When the police kill black people for being homeless, as in this picture on the left on Skid Row in LA a few years ago, when they kill black people for playing with a toy gun in the park, driving with a broken tail light on their car, walking on the street, they are indicating that black presence in public spaces is untenable. And they are evoking the list of lynching pretexts by which the ordinary everydayness of black existence becomes a problem. The police claim they shoot because they are afraid. 
And because of this simple move, the invocation of fear, any and all uses of force, no matter how egregious, become reasonable in the eyes of the law. To use a phrase that harkens back to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, white civilians then act as a posse comitatus, or an unofficial arm of the police, enforcing the slave law against those who fall asleep in the common room of a college dormitory while black, carry suitcases while black, grill food in the park while black, or sit in Starbucks while black. We see the same refusal to concede the political reenfranchisement of black people. For decades, the project of restricting black voting has unfolded under the auspices of the Republican Party and conservative organizations in tandem with it. Momentously, in 2013, the case, in the case Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court of the United States eviscerated the Voting Rights Act of 1965, eliminating the requirement that states that have a history of uh, denying black voting rights get preclearance from the federal government for any changes to their state election laws. As a direct result of this decision, so-called voter ID laws, otherwise known as voter suppression laws, have proliferated from state to state, further restricting the voting rights of blacks, as well as Latinos, students, and the elderly. Together with racial gerrymandering, felon disenfranchisement, the barring of early voting, and the purging of voter rolls, these developments cast serious doubt on whether the democratic formula, one person, one vote, obtains in the US at this point in time and if not now, on whether it ever has. One of the great continuities we observe through US history is the worldview that white dominance is natural and right, and the accompanying desire among whites for what I call racial restoration, the intense longing to return to a golden age when the master class was more assured in its dominance. Sometimes this manifests merely as a sense of loss or a restlessness, sometimes as raw hatred. Ironically, as white dominance remains a structural feature of US society, this is a longing for that which was never actually lost. It is hard to know how to describe this powerful complex of white desire, longing, anger, and hatred. We do not yet have the language. What we do know is that Donald Trump is now in the White House because he connects with this complex of feeling, revels in it, and exalts it to the governing, as the governing spirit of his administration. In office, he has praised neo-Nazi demonstrators, re-mainstreamed white nationalist beliefs and policy goals, and generally acted as someone preoccupied with cleansing the Oval Office and the nation of the contamination of a black president. To his supporters, he says, to all of you who are tired of apologizing for being white, I am your man. And they have responded with a devotion, the likes of which we have not seen in US, modern US political history. Barack Obama's slogan was toward a more perfect union. Donald Trump's slogan is make America great again. The first slogan expresses the wish to improve the nation and thus suggests, however gently, that the nation has not been perfect in the past. The second offers no such admission. To the contrary, it says, we were once great and now are fallen, but we can recapture our greatness. We can restore the nation to glory. But when exactly was America great? When exactly was the golden age? Was it the centuries-long period of slavery or the nearly century-long period of Jim Crow? Whose glory stands to be recuperated and at whose expense? Donald Trump's dream is the dream of racial restoration. Commentary on the Trump presidency has largely focused on what is new about it, what threat it poses to our democratic institutions and norms, and whether it is moving us toward a fascism remnant of the Nazi regime in Germany. There are, of course, many aspects of the Trump presidency that are unprecedented in kind or scale in the US and that threaten US institutions and norms, including the relentless attacks on the press, the degradation of the judiciary, the unprecedented corruption among government officials, the co-opting of congressional leaders, and the contempt for the rule of law and the all-out assault on the truth. At the same time, we must not lose sight of the ways in which the Trump presidency is not something new but a continuation of, indeed an energetic elevation of, a racial worldview that is older than the nation. Yes, Trump's actions today are weakening our institutions and norms, but the worldview he champions has always undermined our very claim to be a democratic society. The failure of the US across the centuries to secure black freedom, to protect the civil and human rights of black Americans and others, to secure the rule of law, 
to guarantee free and fair elections. This failure raises the question of what constitutes democracy and whether we have ever met these criteria. This is what escaped slave and abolitionist Frederick Douglass meant in his 4th of July oration. what black leaders meant by the double V for, for victory campaign during World War II, what Martin Luther King meant in his Riverside church speech challenging American involvement in Vietnam, what Muhammad Ali meant when he refused to be drafted to fight in this war, what Tommy Smith and John Carlos meant by their black power protest at the 1968 Mexico Olympics, and what Colin Kaepernick and his colleagues mean when they decline to stand for an anthem written by a slave owner that contains language that endorses slavery. How can a nation lose something it has never fully achieved in the first place? Can a democracy be in peril if it remains more aspirational than real? Donald Trump is less a newly emergent threat to an extant democracy than a standard bearer for a dream that has been corroding the nation from the inside since its birth. As for the anxiety about sliding into fascism, we might consider a book by James Whitman, professor at Yale Law School, entitled Hitler's American Model the United States and the Making of Nazi Race Law, Princeton University Press, 2017. From World War II to this day, US commentators have held up Nazi Germany as a model of what not to be, as a racist nightmare that shows, by contrast, how racially progressive the US is. But what Whitman shows is that the Nazis carefully studied Jim Crow in the American South as a model for their own measures. What does it mean to discover that it was American anti-blackness that helped to inspire Hitler's regime in the first place? Thomas Mann wrote in The Coming Victory of Democracy that democracy should put aside the habit of taking itself for granted, of self-forgetfulness. It should use this wholly unexpected situation, the fact namely that it has again become problematical, to renew and rejuvenate itself by becoming aware of itself. So as I've suggested in my comments today, American democracy, such that it is, has never not been problematical. But I take Mann's point that moments of crisis are also moments of opportunity. The question is, can we, as we worry about democracy's future, remember that democracy doesn't yet have a past or a present? Can we respond to the dream of racial restoration, a longing for that which was never lost, with a dream of genuine democracy? a longing for that which has not yet come to be. Thank you. Yeah, Claire, thank you so much for this um, touching, shocking, <laughs> but impressive um, presentation. I'm particularly grateful that you also mentioned that um, the history of discrimination, of uh, racial dis discrimination, stratification in society is also a shared history between <laughs> Germany and the United States. Um, but what is particularly shocking for me is this kind of yeah, self-reproduction um, you described of uh, this racial order or this power structure of, of races in the society. And the, the quote you mentioned from 1890, um, where this hopelessness is already described and somehow it's again present today. And what do you think, how, how do you explain this kind of self-reproduction over such a long time. Um, I think what I appreciate so much about Saidiya Hartman's book, Scenes of Subjection, where she looks at um, slavery in the US and the aftermath of slavery, is the discussion she has about the historical time. In the US, there's a very strong tendency, I don't know if this is true in Germany too, but of, to create this um, mythological narrative of progress on, about race. and. The idea that we're sort of teleologically, inexorably moving toward the promised land when it comes to racial equality. And um, Saidiya so Hartman's work really disrupts that notion by saying instead of looking at history uh, as historical time as sort of delivering us inexorably or naturally, that we have to look, think about historical time as um, bringing into creation new modes of racial subjection. So that racial power persists, it just reconfigures itself in a new mode to, to sort of adapt to 
whatever the particular political challenge or political environment is. So one can trace, right, those um, continuities even as one is staying attentive to historical change and contingency. Yeah, personally, I can say after three months in this new city, I'm always impressed, um, at least at first sight, how well it works. I mean, Los Angeles has 50% people with a um, Latin American background, 10% I think with Asian American, so uh, uh, white people are in the mi minority already, maybe not on the west side, but um, uh, more or less, um, this kind of multicultural society works in the daily life, at least from my point of view. But um, Elizabeth, you have a very special view on that uh, as a student at UC Irvine, uh, which is also a very, very multicultural university, if I'm right. And um, you mentioned um, already today that um, a high number of your students at the university is undocumented, and especially with an Asian-American background. Maybe you can tell us a bit uh, about the situation of these students. Sure. Um, is this working? Okay. Um, sure. So UC Irvine has a population of about 800 undocumented students, um, a third of which are actually Asian-American. The majority of those are actually Korean-American. Um, and I, that's like, it's, a, it's often a shocking statistic for people to hear actually how many undocumented Asian Americans there are in the United States. And I think that this kind of connects with, with what Professor Kim is talking about, about the ways that racial hierarchies consist, consistently transform in the United States. So um, I look a lot of my work at the, the ways that Asian exceptionalism narratives, so model minority narratives, um, are narratives that um, have been mobilized throughout the US history, particularly since 1965, to um, kind of confirm these discourses of black, of anti-blackness, right? Um, and, and black inferiority. Um, we talked a lot, you know, the previous panel had been talking about the American dream, right? So post-1965, you can't really have this, you know, kind of outright, we had a, a, a law in the United States outlawing Asian migrants it becomes no longer tenable as the U.S. is trying to set itself up as the leader of the of the free free world in in the post World War II age, right? Um, so these Asian exceptionalism narratives becomes a way to um, become a way to um, say it is not that we are a racist society; it is that look at all of these you know these Asian immigrants who are doing so well and they're thriving on their own. So these claims of the civil rights movement that there's continued persecution of, of black Americans in the United States um, cannot be tenable because look at how well the Asians are doing, right? And so I think that some of the reason that the, the presence and the fact that actually undocumented migration from Asia has, been, has outpaced that of Mexico and Central America for several years now is one that's often obscured in the popular narrative. Um, uh, what's often thought to be an issue that's conflated entirely with Mexican immigrants, right? Um, because it doesn't fit this script. It doesn't fit this script that has been so convenient for asserting this idea that the US is a place where if you just come and work hard and put, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can do what you want. Um, so I, yeah, so like that's that's kind of a problem for a lot of undocumented Asian Asian American immigrants is that um, they're marginalized from their narrative because it is very inconvenient for these. Yeah. As you probably know, we as Germans have problems talking about race and r racial order, but uh, nevertheless, it's uh, also a fact in our society. And so my question would be to Heinz Bude, you as a professor in Kassel, uh, who taught also in Berlin and in Hamburg and other cities, how do you experience this situation in Germany? Is there something alike also in, German, uh, in the German academic world? I think... The main question is, could we find a language for social suffering that could be combined with the language of social progress? I think that's the main problem here. We, we, we do have social sufferings, even in Germany, that are ignored and that have to do with a lot of experiences of people who find themselves as looking not German and, and in their... In their 
personal life. And, and um, it, the, the, I think the wrong political alternative would be to say, no, we are, we are in a society that is dominated by suffering. It is dominated by um, barriers and is dominated by resentment. And it would be wrong to say there is, everything is okay. There is no suffering. And we are obviously in need of a, of a political language that could address suffering and progress as well. And I, am, I believe very deeply if we are missing to find such a language, we are going on the way this Western democracy are more or less being ruled by charismatic figures in a positive or a negative way. And that is, I think, that is, that is the, the, the crucial point I, I would like to make. And um, of course, Germany is not that... The, the cruelties you have mentioned, you have to look, to, they are not obvious in, in the German society, but we have this, this Im impression of suffering that has no address in the political field. We do have this in Germany as well. Would it be okay if we asked um, Liz to speak briefly about her dissertation work? I think it would be really of interest to people. Yeah, sure, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, and, and I think that it, it, it might speak to one of the questions um, that you actually had sent us previously about, you know, how to foster, um, how to foster um, the solidarity amongst, you know, ethnic communities. Would be the next question. Yeah, okay, so, so I'll try to jump one step ahead with that. Is, um, so my dissertation is about um, these very progressive Korean American immigrant rights organizers um, who are many of themselves who are undocumented and who are trying to figure out how to build a solidarity movement that recognizes the, some of the racialized privileges that accrue to Asian Americans um, uh, given, given this kind of what, what Claire has called, uh, excuse me, what Professor Kim has called in her work, racial triangulation of, of Asian Americans vis-a-vis -vis other um, other racialized groups in the United States, um, and how they try to figure out how to build these solidarities with um, Latino and black immigrant rights counterparts, given these strange racial positionings. Um, and it is a very hard task to do, as you know, as Claire, as, I'm sorry, as Professor Kim <laughs> has, um, you know, stated in her in her um, in her presentation, um, this is a country that is foundationally anti-black. It has been the 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 brick and mortar upon which this country has been built, and the idea of who is the proper citizen and who is the deserving immigrant um, is all rooted in in this anti-blackness. And when you're trying to build a racial justice movement that really struggles for that and accounts for that. When you are a, pers a non-white person, of, when you're a non-white person who is not black, it creates a series of, of, of dilemmas, it creates a series of, of responsibilities. Um, and um, as an anthropologist, I'm interested ethnographically into what that looks like on the ground for these Korean American organizers every day. Um, how they struggle with, for example, you know, I think there's a lot when we talk about Trump, there's a danger in saying, in, in many kind of mainstream liberal circles that are, that's kind of like, well, you know, if we get rid of Trump, then all these problems go away, right? As if Trump came out of nowhere and, and, and as if these narratives haven't been sustained, you know, for centuries. Um, but even in kind of like mainstream immigrant rights organizing narratives, you have things like, for example, saying that it's what's going on now with the with the children being separated at the border. Oh, this is so un-American, right? This is this is um, aberrant to an otherwise um, humane society, right? But what about the children of slaves who have, were separated from their parents on auction blocks? What about Native American children who? Uh, were forcibly removed from their parents so they could be sent to boarding sc schools to be 
to be um, taught how to be white, right? Um, so even when you get into these ostensibly more progressive circles, these tensions arise, right? And how these organizers are dealing with is re are dealing with this and and contradicting themselves sometimes and and dealing with this effectively is kind of where the ethnograph the ethnographic part of my dissertation is coming in. I think an interesting discussion is also the um, yeah the somehow the op opposition between minority rights on the one hand side on the focus or the vision for common future on the other side and I, sometimes I ask myself and also it relates to this discussion of Mark Lilla from his publication last year identity politics. Um, did we have uh, too much a focus on minority rights in the last uh, decades? Uh, so we were only talking about the rights of um, certain races, of certain immigrant groups, of so social groups with a sexual orientation, but somehow we lost um, the vision of a common future, of a better future for the whole society. And um, for me personally, but, but, but I might be wrong, that uh, this is also a very relevant question when we talk about the struggle for democracy today. Um, how do we get again um, to this common future of, uh, of our society? What do you think, <laughs> Elizabeth, uh, from your perspective? <laughs> I don't, I think, you know, talking about shifting racial paradigms, I think that's what the dominant multicultural and multiracial paradigm of the kind of 1980s and 1990s in the US tried to do, um, which was to say, you know, we are all one human race, we are all one family, and, you know, um, you know, as, as a mixed race person, I get this a lot of like, oh, you, you know, you're, you're embodying some sort of like ideal future where all the races are mixing together, right? Um, but I think that we, this kind of very celebratory narrative, right? That there's no, of colorblindness, there's no, there's no problem here. But I don't think that we can move forward without struggling with the foundations of, of, of racism in this country. Um, so I think that to move forward and to have a society, we really, I mean, to, to have a, a vision of a future, we have to really ask uncomfortable questions um, and give up certain things that we've become accustomed to. Can I weigh in also? Um, so I was just recently in Edinburgh uh, at a conference where we were talking about race, among other things, and a, a gentleman wrote, raised his hand at the very end and said, why do we need to talk about race? Why can't we just all talk about what unites us and come together? And um, my response to him was, it's not, pow it's not the powerless, it's not the oppressed who create these categories, like racial categories that divide. It's the powerful who create those categories and the rest of us are left trying to live within them or trying to challenge them. Um, so I think the talk about a common future, the talk about a common community, a shared community, is a beautiful ideal. But it, in, the, in the face of ongoing racial oppression, it is a coercive um, comment. It's an, it's an act of coercion to that kind of speech. It's not an act of love, it's not an, an embrace. It's an act of coercion because it's, it's a way of saying, we don't credit your claims. We don't credit that you um, are correct when you tell us about your experiences. We don't credit that you tell us that living while black is an impossibility in the United States. We just want to talk about common futures. So people who really want to talk about a shared community and creating in the United States a genuine democracy first need to take into account that they have, because of their own privileges, and I would in include myself in this because I, as an Asian American woman, I think um, of a certain class background, I have a lot of privileges that other Americans don't have. Um, but until people reckon with those and, and learn to see their neighbors and the people they work with and the people they pass on the street, um, and learn to credit their experiences and, and recognize the legitimacy of those experiences, then, then one is really not interested in a common future. One is more interested in coercing others. I think... I think we are in a shift from the 
idea of a cultural interpretation of a situation into a new social interpretation of a situation. We are moving from the idea of a multicultural society to a multi-social society, and the multi-social society needs obviously an idea of a social majority of our Western societies. And I think that is the main point why Hillary was wrong. She was wrong in the idea that we ha need a kind of additional politics for all culturally interpreted minorities, and she missed the idea of the feeling that there is a no new social majority in, our, in all our Western societies that need a new interpretation for the situation we are in. And you pointed a, a very interesting concept to interpret this social majority. It's not the, the concept of justice, but it's the concept of solidarity. And solidarity is the thing that is missed. Solidarity is a concept that could address social suffering and could address the idea how we could, ha could have an idea that the social suffering in our society is part of, of our own suffering being part of that society. And that is not the idea that we could in terms of, of justice look at the society, but not that we look in terms of solidarity as part of the society, that we are in this society. And I think that is the, the should be an idea of a past Trump policy of the left, just to say it. Uh, a, a left idea of solidarity that is open for these questions and doesn't say, okay, there is an abstract idea of culture or an abstract idea of justice could bring us together. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are already running out of time and it, we would have needed much more time, especially to talk about issues also of media, which is, of course, uh, closely related to the question of social fear. But let me just um, conclude the session with the last uh, uh, question to Elizabeth, um, <laughs> because I was uh, um, particularly impressed that you not only work on your PhD in anthropology, and, but you also work as an activist at the un university, and just to foster this kind of solidarity Hans Bude mentioned, uh, maybe you can just give us an idea what kind of um, activities you do to, to better the situation of the undocumented, undocumented students at your university. Hello. Okay. Um, well, so first of all, there's, um, yes, I do a lot of work on campus um, at UC Irvine um, to um, where I'm, hoping to take a back seat to the undocumented, because I have the privilege of being a citizen, um, to the undocumented students that, themselves who are really taking the lead on this um, and who I try to serve as a support role in my capacity as a graduate student. Um, but I think that the most important part is um, for those kind of well-versed in kind of immigrant rights work in, in the US, you know, there's this thing called the dreamer narrative, right? Which is the idea, which is the, the whole idea behind the DREAM Act that, you know, these kind of young, upwardly mobile, um, non-criminal, you know, uh, undocumented immigrants who the common phrases were brought here through no fault of their own, who were brought here by their parents, are deserving, are more deserving of immigration relief than the parents themselves. Right, so there's been a, a rising voice over the past several years with Im immigrant rights work that um, to reject the streamer narrative, even though it's the most politically, you know, easy thing to do, because it's what's most sympathetic, even to, to Republican lawmakers. Um, but there's an, a rising movement to reject this narrative and say, I'm only here because my parents sacrificed for me, right? So there's a very, so this relates to, so there's a growing consciousness that the activism cannot stop at the university, right? Because it's, it's working for a, for a class that perceives itself as already privileged in some ways, right? 
So I think that the more interesting work is, is the work that I and the students do in, in here in LA, but also in Orange County, just to the south of us where, where our school is, um, where Orange County has typically been seen as this kind of the last bastion of conservatism, conservatism in, in California, a, a place, a kind of white, rich haven um, which actually belies the, the demographic realities of, of Orange County. So there's this really exciting work of these, these coalitions of, of Latino and Korean American and Vietnamese American um, organizations that are coming together to resist what has really, they, they refer to it as the, the Orange County hate circus, which is this nothing short of a white supremacist group who um, has been trying to for several municipalities in Orange County to pull out of SB 54, which is the, san the California sanctuary state law, um, which has resulted in these very violent encounters at these city council meetings, where you see these white supremacist groups um, shouting at 11 year old girl, um, you know, you don't deserve to be here, go back home. We we're gonna have a reign of white babies. Um, we're gonna restore the white race. I mean, this is, this is the reality. Um, and so the work that's being done there is really, really important. I think a lot of the social justice often gets lost in LA, um, but the work that's going on in Orange County right now is really emergent and really important. We do, um, yeah, we have, you know, at the city council meetings, we have these protests, we have rallies, but then we also have the, the more combative stuff, but then there's also community town halls where people just figure out what are we as people of color going to do now? Um, that there is actually someone, we know that these sentiments always exist, but there's actually someone screaming in my face that we're gonna restore the white race. Um, so yeah, come to Orange County and get involved in some of that stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much.